Um, welcome. Thank you very much, folks. Um, I just want to start off with Mike's question to us this morning destabilised us. How many of you have placed a bet? Because my, my weekend Ladbrokes quick, <laughs> quick bet accumulator shows me on line one there is a possibility of me winning £12.79. But when you get to line four, and I promise you I'll pop over and take you out to the pub, £102.87. So uh, uh, that's. And you know the odds against those. Uh, well, I know the odds against me winning anything. So I just thought I would. I thought, how did he know? Um, this this particular project, which uh, I'm doing with uh, with Debs, um, is is really has crept up on us from two original pieces of work. One of which was uh, my own uh, PhD, and Ray, who supervises at the back, and it is, it's nice to have him here, so I can acknowledge his contribution and dragging me screaming and kicking through the process uh, of the PhD. Um, because Debs, uh, who is the human geographer, approached me because she'd read part of it and said, this is interesting because there are connections here with place, about identity, about class, all the sorts of things that human geographers are interested in. And so when we got talking, and I know, knew very little about human geography, I know a wee bit more now, um, started really to develop into those notions of the image of the Scot, if you like. Um, and there is a video clip right at the very end, which I'd like to say is only a 40 second clip, but it is it brings us right up to date. So although we start in this particular period of the late uh, 19th century and looking in particular cross-country running and its development and so on, which was I, I was particularly interested in, it also takes us into the nub and the thrust of the debate surrounding indie ref as it was referred to in Scotland, which you will know much better as the independence referendum. Um, because the whole notion about distinctiveness and difference was something that the Scots claim they have lived with for many years and that the English have significantly failed to understand about it. And so much of the debate centred around <coughs> the notion of the Scots making their case for distinctiveness and difference and self-determination and much of the anti-independence rhetoric centred around anti-Englishness, which the Scots really couldn't understand. We said we'd promise to give you your turf back from Wembley sometime, and so we thought we might well do it when we were independent. So it's, it's really taking, if you like, three key themes uh, through this. Um, sorry, let me just turn that on to the, the slideshow properly, and then we can <coughs> uh, come to slide taking uh, three key themes, if you like, uh, from this. So we've, we've developed, if you like, a notion about the human nature, the human to nature relationship in the context of rapid industrialization. And some of the statistics that I just want to push in later, um, to some extent are quite shocking, uh, specifically in relation to housing and health, and therefore the urban rural relationship in Scotland uh, becoming fundamentally different from any other part in the UK by the nature of land ownership, which is very different in Scotland than it is in the rest of the UK. And so therefore, the notion of environment uh, and landscape uh, and about an idealised, an emerging image, if you like, of an idealised uh, uh, identity and uh, ideas countryside. And it's about embodied within a view of, of a Scottish identity which was emerging and therefore a, a new heritage. So it, it really looks in more detail at the elevated positioning, if you like, um, of the rural in late Victorian uh, Britain. And I, and I was struck by um, a paper which I think, Mike, I can't remember who your co-author was, um, where you talked about micro-studies being critically important to some extent in being able to elevate voices within studies. So cross-country running was not a big sport. Um, indeed, it was a sport that was engaged in specifically in Scotland, mainly by other sports, in order to keep themselves fit. And therefore, it takes one sport, if you like, very much a micro-study within this whole notion of pushing some ideas forward. 
Um, the second theme that came out was are some of the key themes in human geography, if you like, about socio-spatial structures, about uh, dualism, more of that later, release, attachment to place. Perhaps almost sort of topophilic in nature, um, if you like, but it is about place attachment and also about consumption. And one of the other issues we came across was with the health agenda, which was quite a focus in Scotland, and you'll see why with some of the, um, the health stats that come out, um, the notion of therapeutic landscapes starts to emerge. And in the video at the end, there is a huge meshing um, of these issues that start to develop. The video is only 40 seconds, but it contains just about everything we, we could possibly have wanted. And then thirdly, we're looking really about sport as a cultural practice and a form of sport, uh, social marker. Um, uh, I, I was struck with, um, with the uh, occupations of the pedestrians, for example, whereas the occupations of the early cross-country runners uh, who formed the initial clubs in Scotland were all absolutely professional middle classes. Um, there really was no working class ethos about these people um, and, and we'll, we'll come to that and we'll look at the sorts of homosocial spaces, homosocial practices and the gentrified practices that, that start to come out. So that's the sort of background, if you like, um, to, 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 what we were, to what we were doing. So on the first um, of these, one of the, we were looking at um, the notion of sport diffusions, if you like. Um, sporting practice in Scotland, I'm sure you're aware through this sort of cultural iconography, uh, usually stems from Highland Games. If, if, you, if you want stereotypical images uh, of the Scottish sportsman, it, it's red hair, it's kilts, lots of whiskey, possibly a bit of sharp red, and tossing capers and, and so on and so forth. And while there is certainly a degree of that, um, that is also played out much later on in our study about what the image that is that the Scottish nation at the time was seen to be perpetuating and how it used and still uses landscape as much of that uh, as well. So it, it did change and the Highland Games were very much a function of the monarchy um, it is important to acknowledge Balmorality and Victoriana uh, at the time. Um, Victoria, who came up to Balmoral in 1842, and I was struck by my colleague's paper on the, the Isle of Wight, for example, um, because the date you gave us for Osborne is, is almost synchronous to the date that the Balmoral estate was bought in 1846 again used as a, um, a rural residence um, to, get, to get away uh, from, from, from the, the, the urbanised or the developing urbanised uh, background of her. And the 1848 games of Balmoral, the Balmoral games which are the, the key ones, uh, are the ones that we all sort of remember. There were other games at the time as well, um, but these tend to be the, the sort of Balmoral estate, the beginnings of what what, what I, and it's a lovely phrase I think he uses, what Tom Nairn calls the glamour of backwardness. This is about developing a cultural heritage uh, and it's about glamorising it, bringing it to the fore, developing it so that it becomes real, so that it becomes very much part of the imagery that, that we have. Um, and Linda Colley's work later on talks about Great Britain as very much an invented tradition, forged on war, she claims. So it's very much about this sort of militaristic, glamorised, almost backward notion formed on the monarchy at the time. And Victoria was very keen to develop that because I think with the decreasing role of the monarchy, there was a real sense in which the monarchy at that time needed and had to be associated with other things. So it was about... Um, keeping alive memories of the past. And Grant Jarvie's work in that area of the Highland Games uh, is, is, is tremendous in that respect. So it's about looking at the nature and use of land. And in Scotland, I think it is important to remember that the land did change quite significantly. So as people were moved out, the sheep were moved in, the sporting estates developed and so on. And if you're looking for a contemporary view of that, 
then I can really recommend Andy Whiteman's book um, on the ownership of, of, the, of the Scottish land mass. It's a, a wonderful piece of work and is based on uh, very much the notion that very few people, is that there was a theatre company, is it the seven, somebody needs to help me, is it the, Ray, I'm looking to you for help here, 784 Theatre Company, the Chevy at the Stag and the Black, Black Oil. 784, I think it is. It's something like 7% own 84% of the land in Scotland, which is really quite a remarkable feature. I don't think it differs too much uh, from some of, of what we have in England as well, with the big landowners being the Crown Estate, the church, uh, and so on. So I'm sure there are parallels with that. But we were particularly uh, interested in looking at the land as part of the celebration of a, a notion of an identity and how land is used and how it's consumed and how organised sport developed mainly as a practice that out of the urbanised, developing under urbanised and industrial processes and cross country running therefore it seems prime as a sense that as a sport which did develop from the industrial processes nevertheless took itself back in to the land and back in to the countryside rather than the other sports such as rugby and football and cricket which had grounds which were around and about the urbanised area for all sorts of good reasons not least of which was uh, transport and sort of things and, and we were struck by about the celebration of a valiant and honourable past and there's a wonderful um, quote here uh, was of course somewhat at odds with the, what was only a less, less than a century before. This notion of Scottishness, remember, was that the Scots have always been troublesome. And you may remember, well none of you should remember, but there was a, a little rebellion in 1745. Um, and uh, so just, just over a hundred years earlier, the Scots were described as barbarous papists under the direction of their priests who practiced robbery and violence. Oh, I, I, did, I, did mention, I did mention the Wembley goalposts and the turf which we will return to you in, in due course. Well, it's very interesting when we, did, when we started this paper to, to try to see the changes that took place in very short periods of time about how this invention of an image took place and how the Scots therefore sanitised themselves and, and more, of, more of that a little bit later. So into this milieu of new sporting uh, uh, practices uh, came the sporting polymaths from football, cycling, swimming and gymnastics, really part of a changing Scottish cultural process and an emergence there. We also were struck by the sport in terms of its class. Um, when we explored both the record books of the three primary clubs at the time, which were Edinburgh Harriers, West of Scotland Harriers and Clydesdale Harriers, they were all professional classes. And indeed in one of the census returns, it was quite interesting to see writers to the signet, these are lawyers in Scotland, or solicitors rather in Scotland, writers to the signet, writers to the signet, writers to the signet, um, uh, merchant, um, retail um, shop owner, and, and so on. So these, these well people, if you like, who were, who were further down the food chain, they were men of means, if you like, um, and it was, it was really uh, important to them that they developed their own sort of class consciousness through this. And indeed the press reported that when the West of Scotland Harriers were formed, they were a social elite and were described as an omnium gatherum institution uh, by the most influential athletic men in the West of Scotland. Um, Clydesdale Harriers had John Mellish, who was a secretary to a member of parliament at Westminster, who was also president of Glasgow Rangers, now no longer exists, it's simply called Rangers. Andrew Dick was a chief accountant of the British South African Company. And so these were people who were really quite well up uh, within their, their social uh, classes, if you like. So a number of these things started, unfortunately, to, to help to confuse us a little bit in terms of, well, what does that mean? And one of the lines we're trying to take was, is, is the iconography of the image of the Scot and the image of an identity which may be national, and there are multiple identities, understandably, but this one of a national identity, was it propelled by a particular grouping and class in particular? 
That's a key question we've asked ourselves. And certainly, when you look at the, the press reports, the reports in the, um, in the handbooks of the clubs themselves, they were written very much in particular ways. And it was important for us to remember that. When I mentioned the phrase sporting polymaths, one, one guy is, is really quite interesting. He's called Stuart Laurie. Stuart Laurie was a successful businessman who was, and I hope I get all of these right, president of Queen's Park Football Club, president of the West of Scotland Harriers, president of the Scottish 3As, president of the Scottish Gymnastics Association, and president of the Scottish uh, Swimming Association, all at the same time. Now, I don't know when he found time to work, but it is interesting that they took on these roles very much as, as social markers. Four minutes. Um, four. Um, so it, it's, it's about actually trying to develop the notion of the, what, what else is, is circulating in there. One of the things we discovered with the Harriers clubs was the notion of homosocial behaviours. Um, so the gentlemen's clubs were formed, uh, they were extremely popular, um, they were based at hotels, um, uh, they decided very early on to move themselves from hotels to get into and buy their own rooms. These rooms were there so that they could have um, games at billiards where they could have overnight accommodation for those members who lived outside the town. Um, very much liminal behaviours associated with them. Um, there were dances, there were smokers, there were conversaciones, there were all sorts of activities and engagements by these men. Um, and drink was often part of it, which was quite a juxtaposition um, with what was seen to be acceptable behaviour. In fact, there was one lovely report where they got so drunk one night that they trapped the horse and carriage that was taking them all back. There was this bus thing. Um, managed to be ditched in the darkness, so there were two horses down a ditch with a trap and about 20 drunken men trying to pull the trap and the, the horse back out of it. So there's some lovely um, iconography comes out here. And we were also taken with the notion that perhaps for too long we've been caught in possibly the notion of the muscular Christian and the religious formation, the religious ethic type of thing. And we were struck both by uh, Dick Holt and Tony Mangan's <coughs> slight rewrite, if you like, of this new aesthetic that is coming out now. Less of the religious undertone, much more of the instrumentalism, um, if you like, um, coming out. So there is very much a sense in which there is a, a dualism, um, and that dualism is critically important um, in, in considering the countryside as a place of consumption and amenity, where there are all sorts of things going on in relation to industrialised centres, um, and the notion of landscape being seen as an escape, if you like. That attachment in place with immersion Especially with the sensory emotional thing. This is one of the things I don't think, I certainly haven't been able to capture quite as succinctly as I would like with a lot of the studies. Why do, why, why are um, football grounds seen as these cathedrals and emotional spaces? And I know there's been some work on football grounds and to some extent on cricket and rugby, but less so on, on other places. So it became as much as a physical as it did an emotional experience. But the health thing struck us most of all. I just want to read you out just seven. I know it sounds a lot, but it isn't uh, key statistics. Just prior to the period 1850, one third of Scottish houses consist of one room. I'd like to digest that. One third of all. That room measured 14 feet by 11. Now when I say one room, I mean one room. That's where the cooking was done, that's where procreation took place, that's where the children slept, and so on. And there are, um, for example, in Edinburgh, uh, there was recordings of between 6 to 15 inhabitants in any one room. Um, by 1911, these rooms were affectionately called in Scotland single ends. Or if you want the patois, single ends. All right, that's what they were called, single ends. In 1911, single ends still made 10% of the Scottish total. By 1913, 94% of Edinburgh's single end shared a toilet and 43% shared a sink. 
By the time you get to Dundee, prior to the 1880s, just 10 years before, now this took me a wee while to digest, 91,664 inhabitants had just five WCs, three of which were in hotels. <clears throat> so to talk about the health issues in Scotland as part of this whole notion about exercise, manly activity and so on, and again it's important to remember that the housing stock in Scotland is also fundamentally different than it is in England. In Scotland we built up. In England, you tended to go out. And so that's how this developed. And by the cities often had cheek and jowl, the middle classes, the new urban classes, living cheek by jowl with these single ends. And so by the early 20th century, 60% of all Scots, and again, this is an interesting statistic. If you imagine the Scottish map and take it from Greenock in the west, which is just left of Glasgow, right through to Edinburgh, the narrowest neck, only about 50 to 60 miles. 60% 60 of all Scots lived in that belt, which ran from Greenock, through Glasgow, through Lanarkshire, into Edinburgh. By comparison, in London at the same time, only 17% of the English population lived in London. So 60% lived in the central belt, and 17% in London. And uh, the health impact were, were quite significant uh, in that. What is uh, very interesting is that today, and I'll, it, the work I've quoted from is 2014, half a million urban Scots today do not have a front door or back door or no private garden or gate. They live in very different types of, of, of environments because they live in tenements, so to speak, uh, of which many English cities have their equivalent, but not to the same extent. So. The health impacts also impacted essentially on, on this as well. Okay, so we then moved on to the notion of Joe Little's therapeutic landscapes, and then the final one, which really is the one we sort of started to get to grips with, which we started to look at place myths. Was the countryside an entrance into which people went, returning back again into the city, sort of Narnia-esque? type approach to this, um, if you like. And then we've got the rewriting of Scottish history with Walter Scott and Macpherson, Balmorality, and the selling of an image, if you like, the popular image of Harry Lauder and the entertainment and industry and the theatre. Uh, and then this, the Hardy Scott. And it's, it's with the Hardy Scott that uh, I would like to finish with, if I may, with this 40 second video clip um, because this image of Scottishness, which essentially runs through the piece of what we're doing, um, was accidentally, um, I accidentally saw it uh, in an advert for Scottish rugby in the 21st century shown on Scottish television. And everything's in there. Uh, it's a short clip, it's only the 40 seconds, so if I can come out of this successfully and go on. I might need help, I may not, I think it's this one, and if I just do this on to full screen, have a look at this. This is my country, the land that begat me. These windy spaces are surely my own, and those who here toil in the sweat of their faces are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Hard is the day's task, Scotland's stern mother, wherewith at all times thy sons have been faced. Yet do thy children honour and love thee, harsh is thy schooling, yet great is the gain. True hearts and strong limbs, the beauty of faces, kissed by the wind and caressed by the rain. to my eye, I'm sort of filling up as I'm <laughs> uh, Alexander Gray's poem, Scotland, um, where you have all the prose and the imagery of landscape, weather, environment. Thank you. 